Chapter number five, we're going to look at the Benoni in this chapter. That's where black plays an early c5. We're going to start with d4, knight f6, c4. And if black plays c5, that can transpose into these lines, but I want to give you the Catalan move order to get to the Benoni. e6, g3, c5. On to c5, when I first started playing this exact move order back in about 2012, this came out of Boris Avruk's book, Grandmaster Repertoire. And one of the ways to try to punish this move order is to play a quick c5. And the reason for that is because oftentimes in the Benoni, white does not want to play g3. There's much better systems to kind of punish black for playing the Benoni. So c5 became extremely popular as a way to try to refute Avruk's repertoire. But I have some fun ideas coming up for you guys. So we're going to play d5, go for that advantage in the Benoni. After e takes d, c takes d. If you haven't seen the Benoni before, the idea is for black to give us this strong pawn on d5, except that they're a little bit passive in the center. But they're going to play d6, bean kettle that bishop, play for b5, and really get a ton of dynamic play in, in exchange for that strong pawn on d5. So I got a way for you guys to figure out how to shut down black's fun. D6 is the most common move, so we're going to look at that first, but we'll come back and look at what happens if black plays B5 immediately, which is pretty common at the club level. All right, so first we're going to play pawn to E4. This is a fun move, and black cannot capture, and we'll cover that coming up. Um, so let's say black plays pawn to G6. That's the main move. You're trying to fiend kettle. This is the chess goals wrinkle in this system. If you have other chess goals courses, you know we like to sprinkle in these kind of moves that are rare, but interesting, and give us good chances to play for a win, kind of keep the game in our court. That's what we're doing with f3. We're trying to prevent all of black's main ideas in the Benoni. There's no bishop to g4, obviously, because the pawn on f3, um, and there's no knight on f3. So we're kind of trying to hold this space advantage and not allow black to trade any minor pieces. If black trades minor pieces, that's what their goal is usually, and then they can get the pawns rolling on the queen side where they have three versus two. So, okay, after bishop g7, we're going to go king f2. This move looks strange, but it's actually a lot of fun. Our plan is to move the king over to g2, play h4, knight h3, keep black's position cramped. And there's no games in this line. So what I'm doing now is I'm choosing ideas for black that I think make the most sense. We're in that rare of territory that there's zero games. Let's say black castles. I think this is the most likely move. Here we can play king to g2, and our king sits very nicely on g2. The h1 rook is sometimes useful here with that h1 marching up the board. And black still has what uh, this issue with the four minor pieces. They're a little bit cramped. They're getting in the way of each other. Black has to figure out how do they get those pieces developed. Usually the d7 knight heads to e5, trying to trade for the f3 knight. There's no knight on f3. Okay, so after knight b to d7, uh, we'll look at a couple other moves on move 9 instead of knight d7. But first we'll look at this. Knight h3 is the recommendation. What I like about knight h3 here is there's no bishop takes h3, which would draw our king out. So keep that in mind. We don't play knight h3 when the bishop can capture it and it draws our king out. And what we're going to do is bring that knight back to f2. We're playing this kind of tricky maneuvering game to get all of our pieces developed. A6 by black. This is the next key point. Whenever black plays a6 in these lines, they want to play b5 next and get their comfortable queenside expansion. b5 right away obviously fails to bishop takes b5. Sorry, the arrows are going wild today. So whenever you see a6, play a4. a4 is the way to shut down the b5 plan. The a4 pawn guards b5. And that's just a general rule in all these lines. You see a6, you play a4. Rook to b8. Trying to force through this move. Knight to c3. Three defenders for us, two defenders for black. So again, black cannot quite play pawn to b5. Knight to e5. This is a bit sneaky, um, but actually, there is a threat to get b5 in for black. And it involves first playing bishop takes h3 check, drawing our king away, and then the f-pawn gets targeted. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Then there's queen d7 check. So bishop takes h3, king takes queen d7 check and guarding b5. So if we try to prevent b5, it's going to drop a piece after bishop takes h3 and the queen fork. I was getting my lines confused. So here we're going to bring the knight back, knight to f2. We get rid of that tactic of bishop h3 and queen d7. Knight to e8 by black. Common Benoni idea. Oftentimes black wants to play pawn to f5 for their kingside play, and they're still looking to play pawn to b5 soon. And now we have great timing to play f4. This square is guarded by both knight and queen, so there's no knight to g4 for black. And if knight back to d7, now we hit black with h4. This pawn's coming up the board, and we have a kingside attack coming. Um, feels like we're having all the fun. And we're definitely fine with this trade because that g7 bishop is an important defender of these dark squares around the black king. So let's look at f5. Here we can go h5. And the eval is plus 0 0.4 thanks to the extra space that we have and this kingside attack that we're forming. So it's not a huge advantage, half a pawn, um, but we have a nice kingside attack going. This is the main line for black. So now let's go back. Move number nine, we looked at knight b to d7. Let's look at knight to a6. 